have one. I'd like to have one when you have time. To okay. Yeah, Good morning. My name is Dwight Lubitsch. I was a Navy a carrier pilot and an LSL Navy signal officer. Flying um, probably driven aircraft, the S-2 tracker and the AD Sky Raider. And my experience was on uh, anti-submarine carriers, both straight and angle deck, both pilot and landing signal officer. Now the presentation you will be uh, watching uh, will be um, made to, from uh, my memory a few seconds. And these reference books I've used uh, you may have this one sold in the ship store. The one on the end, the SS class carriers, is probably the most uh, uh, friendly or informative of all four of these books. So you may want to uh, get that for your library to, uh, if you want to delve further into the uh, evolution of the SS class carriers. Before I start on the subject of the flight deck and the optical landing system and paddles, I'd like to uh, clarify some confusion or maybe educate you in case you didn't know this about the changes that Hornet and other SS class carriers underwent. They're called SCB, Ship's Characteristic Board. The, uh, you've heard referred to these carriers as the 27 Alpha or 27 Charlie. Well, I'll explain that now. Hornet received the SCB 27 Alpha conversion in the early 50s when she was being converted to an attack carrier. And I'll try to remember what all these different uh, changes were. Starting off, the armor belt was removed from around the waterline. The hull was widened eight feet at the waterline. Because more weight was put into the ship, it sunk further in the water. So a blister hull had to be built. So the ship was widened. A 27 Charlie conversion was widened by 10 feet. That's the only difference between the two. Now, what they did, if you look down the side of the island here, the original side of the ship went straight down to the water. And they widened it, they were able to build out this way, and the quarter deck when you come aboard, it's that much wider than original. The uh, ready rooms were moved, all but one were moved below the hangar deck, under the armor deck, because they had some access on some of the ships and people got killed in the ready rooms when they were underneath the flight deck. So they were moved down below the armor deck, the hangar deck, that's when the elevator was put on, the escalator rather. Additionally, down on the hangar bays, the fire splinter doors that were put in, that was part of the 27 Alpha or Charlie conversions. Increased fuel capacity for uh, ship's fuel and aviation fuel. The flight deck was uh, uh, built stronger. The elevators were capable, built capable of handling heavier aircraft. The uh, hydraulic catapult was on this side, the starboard side was at H4, that was removed. And an H8 was put there and one on the other side, because originally, as you know, there was only one catapult up on the flight deck, and that was the starboard cat, that was at H4. The other one was down at Hangar Bay 1. So the hydraulic H8 cats were put on here with the jet blast defectors. Now, a 27 Charlie conversion were C11 steam cats, and the number one aircraft elevator was elongated to take longer, heavier, aeroplanes. The arresting gear was replaced with a Mark V arresting gear. It's still straight deck now. We're not talking the angle deck or hurricane bow. This is still straight deck. The uh, arresting wires where the system was improved to a Mark V arresting wire system. The number three aircraft elevator was moved over to the start to the side as a waste elevator. Originally it was in the center of the deck like number one. The pit, the Medical is now in the pit of what used to be elevator number three. Oh, now the island, a little bit on the island. Originally there was a tripod mast. A pole mast was put up. The funnel was cut on the bias. And that's all I can think of right now for SCB-27 Alpha Charlie. SCB-125, this is the hurricane conversion. Hurricane bow, angled at, and moving pry fly up to where it is now. That was done at about 56 on most of these SS class carriers. The 27 Alpha and Charlie were done in the early 50s. The last conversion that Hornet got and many of the others that became CBS carriers was SCB 144. 144 was to do with ASW. Up on the keel where the stem comes down and the keel starts back, an SQS 23 sonar dome was placed, a bulbous thing like this, for 
the better detection of submarines. Thus, the port anchor was removed and it was put in the stem. That's why we had a stem anchor in the center of the ship. The reason being, if you're swinging on the hook on a port or starboard anchor, as the ship turns with wind or tide, that chain could go underneath there and shear that dome off. And the last part of 144 was improved CIC with a increased uh, or expanded ASW uh, capability. Are there any questions? The Air Department on an S class carrier was one of nine departments. It was composed of about 300 officers and men, maybe a dozen officers, starting with the Air Boss, the commander by rank. Now, you may ask, what about a mini boss? When these were attack carriers, I understand they had a mini boss assisting. But in my experience on the uh, on ASW carriers, most of which was on the straight deck, there's only room for one air boss and two enlisted men in the old tower up there. I don't know whether there was a mini boss on a uh, ASW carrier or not. At least you had the air boss, the commander. And then you had other officers that were a catapult, a resting gear, flight deck, aircraft handling, hangar deck, a fuels officer, a transfer, and then you had your chiefs and on down the line. The uh, responsibility of the Air Department was moving aircraft around the flight deck, the hangar deck, maintaining, or rather operating the aircraft elevators, maintaining and operating the catapults, the arresting gear, the fueling aircraft, and some limited uh, aircraft support to the air group. The way it was organized, it was organized in V divisions, V standing for aircraft, heavier than air aircraft. V1 was flight deck, V2 catapults, V3 arresting gear, V4 fuels, and V6 was AIMD, Aircraft Intermediate Maintenance Department, which was responsible for maintaining the ship's airplanes, which were primarily in an ASW uh, operation, the uh, ship's COD, and then uh, providing some limited support to the, uh, the air group or air wing. The uh, flight deck was physically divided into three sections, Fly 1, Fly 2, and Fly 3. Fly 1 was forward, catapults, Fly 2 was crash, uh, salvage, medical, uh, directors, and aircraft handlers, and Fly 3 was uh, resting gear. Starting with the uh, flight deck tour, we'll start, I'll point this out, this is called a flare elevator, one of the three ordnance elevators on the ship. This uh, rusted uh, plate here is the top of the main ordnance elevator. When you're in orientation, to your right is a big door that is the same shaft for this bomb elevator. Ordnance could be brought up and loaded in the hangar deck or could be brought up and bombed, the aircraft bombed up on the flight deck. This uh, drain channel going across the deck is exposed and you can get an idea of what the, before the pad eyes were put in for tying aircraft down, this is what was used. Going way back, before chains, they used rope and line. You can get an idea of what the original deck looked like underneath the non-skid. It's the uh, teak wood. This is the jet blast fence that was put in with SCB, the 27 Alpha and Charlie, when the H8 cats or the steam cats were put in comes up about this high to blood deflect a hot a jet exhaust blast when the airplane's at full power. Moving down towards the starboard catapult, this is the holdback track. It has little notches in it where you can move a thing along. Short cable comes out with a cup in the airplane, like the S2 over there, the same device pulls down and you put a small dumbbell in there and that's what breaks when the airplane is launched. If you move uh, pan over here, you see this diagonal line coming in, white line coming across and then down here. That's a guideline for the director for the left main mount or probably maybe the nose gear to get an airplane lined up on the catapult correctly the first time. You can imagine if it's not done right the first time, the airplane's got to be pushed back and that really slows down the evolution. 
These lights you see in here put a low glow of white light in this area for night operations. And then down here is the launch track. The shuttle is missing now. When we get to the other side, we'll look at the shuttle in the port track. This is 211 feet long. It will launch a 40,000 pound airplane up to 90 knots. Obviously, jets need more than 90 knots, so you need wind over the deck so it doesn't end up in the water down there. Over the side, we're looking at the firing panel or the shooter panel right down here for the starboard catapult. There's buttons down there for uh, tensioning and uh, firing and retract and so on. This person with sound powered phones is connected down to the catapult room so they can communicate. The catapult can't be fired from down below in case this panel is out of service. And if you look across the deck, pan over there, we're just about where the garbage can is. That is where the firing panel is for the port catapult. This is the number one aircraft elevator, center line elevator. When the elevator starts down, these posts come up, they have a cable connecting them. It's like a safety fence all the way around to keep people from stepping off onto the elevator once it starts. And the elevator drops at such a rate that if you step off just as it leaves, you won't catch it until it gets down to the bottom. <laughs> what was here at one time was the original operation panel, so it could be operated from here. And that's not, obviously it's not usable, there's nothing there now. We operated from down in the hangar bay, but there were two places you could operate it from here. Normally it was here or down in the hangar bay. Earlier I talked about the hole back fitting over on the catapult. This, uh, and I mentioned I'd come over to the S2 and show you what it looks like. This is the part that's on the airplane. This is spring loaded. This dumbbell fits in here, and then a cup like that is here that goes down to the deck through a cable, swage cable, and into the deck. And when the airplane, the catapult pulls, this breaks and the airplane is slung off, just like a, uh, a slingshot. So that's the holdback fitting. All airplanes have some sort of a holdback arrangement. The modern jets, it's, uh, it's nose gear tow, so the holdback fitting is right behind the nose gear. We're at the port catapult now. This is what's called a shuttle. The cables come up from the catapult room and they hook to each end of it. When it's fired, it's pulled down the track and the cable aft retracts it to the arm position. The airplane will be sitting here. The S2, for example, would have a single bridle that went around this uh, shoe and then went up and hooked into the belly of the airplane. Other aircraft like the AD Sky Raider and A4 Skyhawk have a different arrangement. It comes out like this and then it hooks to the landing gear because with the AD you have the propeller in the way and with the A4s you had the uh, center line fuel tank, so the, it was a different arrangement. But like I said, the newer carriers are all nose gear tow, a different arrangement. I'll talk about deck markings now a little bit. Over here is a line that goes back and all the way up to the number 12 up there with an arrowhead. Back here are boxes, about so big, painted, wherein there should be numbers. The first box would have a 400 in it, 425, 450, every 25 feet, back to 625. That's the dis distance from that point down to the bow. That's for free deck launches, wherein the air boss would look at a chart, look at aircraft weight, wind over the deck, and decide how much run is needed to get into the air down there. Only a few knots above stall speed, and in the case of multi-engine aircraft like the S2, you did not have single engine speed but they didn't worry about single engine speed in the Navy. These, this line here was uh, repainted a while back. It should be only a third the width of that, but the colors are correct. This is a safety line or a foul line. If there's any object on this side of the line, the landing area is closed, no landings. And it's lighted for a night operation. As, as I forgot to mention, the uh, free deck launch line is lighted as well. Now this line over here should be white. 
all the way down to where it turns to white, solid white. This, these lines were repainted for a Buick ad last year, and they were never repainted correctly. The circles you see are helicopter spotting circles. Now I'll talk a little about the island and the modifications that were made to the island part of the 27 Alpha uh, conversion. We'll start forward of the island. I forgot to mention earlier the anti-aircraft guns were removed. Coming up where the Admiral's Bridge is now, that was not the Admiral's Bridge. There, it protruded out and there were anti-aircraft guns in that area. Then up to the Captain's Bridge, if you look at pictures down in the wardroom, you can see all of it what it looked like originally. The captain's bridge was open, coming up above that big uh, wine vat up there was the base of the anti-aircraft fire control director. Now going up to the mast, that's the pole mast that replaced the tripod mast. Coming over to the funnel area, that was cut on the bias where it used to be just squared off. Coming down now below the number 12, between the 05 and 06 decks where it's open in that area. That's where Pride Fly originally was. Now we go forward, rather aft. Pride Fly and the cab below it were part of the angle deck uh, conversion. The cab is where a person stood with originally 8 millimeter or 16 millimeter rather and then later video cam to shoot all the landings and all the takeoffs. Now Vulture's Row used to be on the 06 level, below what we use now as Vulture's Row. Up there was the anti-aircraft fire control director for the AF 5 inch 38 deck guns. Then finally the big dome at the back is the approach control radar for CCA, carrier controlled approaches. Of course in World War II they didn't have that, and then later, in my experience on the Lake Champlain, it was a much smaller, it looked a lot like these cocoons over the anti-aircraft fire control directors. You know, about just about that big around. I'll now talk about the composition of the flight deck. This was the last class of carriers to have wooden flight decks. And why weren't they steel like the British? Because it was felt that, and have this, the armored deck, was felt that a battle damage out in the Pacific could not be repaired by ship's welder. We would have to come to a yard, back to Pearl, earlier in the day, in, in the earlier in the war. So we made the armored deck the hangar deck, and this is over I-beams, about 3 16th inch uh, steel plate, uh, California Douglas fir over with uh, teak wood over it. Now I think these ships, I'm not sure, originally had a different kind of wood on the flight deck because all 24 were built in four yards on the east coast. And during the war, I can't imagine bringing teak wood from the Orient to, de to make the decks of these ships back there. So it was probably an East Coast hardwood that was used originally. and They've all been redecked. And then there's a non-skid paint over that. This, I'm standing on the second expansion joint. There's three expansion joints in the flight deck. One down by the catapults, this one, and then that one back there you can see. This. Uh, area of the deck was changed later and I think pretty sure the reason I've never read this but it makes sense this is a composition of hard aluminum plating and plywood the thinking being that when the jet airplanes touch down <clears throat> they had to bolter they had power and rotate something like a say a crusader that's the tail pipe is pretty low to the to the deck especially when you rotate the vector of that hot exhaust flame is going right down on the deck and so if we didn't have this composition, this would burn up very quickly and have to be replaced. And finally, aft of this area, there's a large rectangle that's all solid aluminum, hard aluminum plating. And that is where the tail hook slams down. That's where the resting wires would be. When this was a straight deck, we had 12 wires back there and Davis barriers down here and Palisades barriers later when the jets came out, which was a, high, a nylon arrangement that was up about uh, so high. But the original um, barriers, we call them fences, were Davis barriers. They were 56 inches off the deck and they were resting cables attached to engines that came up and were, were uh, suspended by fine cables across. 
and they were up about this high. Now the stanchions dropped down once the airplane landed successfully, the airplane taxi forward, then they came back up again. The idea was to stop airplanes, to keep them from going down the deck in case you didn't catch a wire. Now those were eliminated on the angle deck because you don't need them. You bolter, if you don't catch a wire, you go around again. That's the barriers. I'll talk about the barricade a little later. The SS class straight decks did get barricades later when the jets came aboard. And they were, the barricade was located, if I remember, on the Lake Champlain, somewhere forward around where that porthole is. It was that far forward. It was, it was forward of the barriers, the Davis barriers or the Palisades barriers. So I go over and talk about the uh, mirror. I'll now talk about the optical landing system, OLS, also known as the lens, the Fresnel lens. On the straight deck carrier, we didn't use this, this uh, method. On the straight deck, we used paddles and flew a flat pass around behind the ship. On the angle deck carrier, you flew a higher pattern. About 350 feet, when you roll out of the center line, you should pick up a centered meatball. Originally, the experimental carriers with the optical landing system was a portable unit, and it was over on the other side behind the island. And that was a, a lens, or rather a mirror. It was literally a mirror. Same principle as this. In lieu of the stack of five Fresnel lenses, you had a mirror, a concave mirror, with a separate light source aft, and that angle that went into the mirror projected out into space to give you your glide path. It was moved over to this side on all the S's class, and Hornet originally had a mirror before it had the lens. But then this was developed. The Fresnel lens, French word, F-R-E-S-N-E-L, people pronounce it various ways, but Fresnel is the correct a French pronunciation, was developed in 1820 by a fellow who developed the, uh, the lens for lighthouses, taking a single light source, uh, projecting it through a concave, or rather, uh, 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 prisms that reflected and refracted light into a single beam. Each one of these creates a beam that goes out into space. Now that beam is 40 degrees wide very thin. So you think of it as these wafers going out into space. And there's five. They're not parallel. They're diverging, something like that. Now, the angle that this is set at depends upon the type aircraft that's coming aboard. And this is done by the Air Boss up in Pride Fly. First, the roll angle is set this way. And then the pitch angle is set this way by the airboss. You can see the shaft there on which the it is mounted to adjust it in pitch. But first you adjust the roll and then the then the pitch. Now I have a handout that I have with my flight deck tour that uh, I don't I looked in the filing cabinet today and there's not uh, any in there. There's no a file for it. It's it's very uh, detailed on how this is done. My adaptation in the handout is very is oversimplified just to get the principle of how this thing works. The lights, the horizontal lights going across the call reference are datum lights. The blue lenses, when the lights are turned on, they shine green. What you want to see is the centered cell or the meatball image as you come down the glide path. The optimum is on this class carrier is your tail hook to clear around down 10 to 12 feet. If you stay on that glide path, you'll snag number three wire, the optical wire. Now, it gets the, the angle that's set for each type of aircraft depends upon the eye, the tail hook distance. You take a little airplane like an A4 Skyhawk, it's this much. You take an airplane like a Crusader, you take an airplane like an A3 Sky Warrior, it's greater. So the larger the airplane, it will be set, the angles are three, three and a half, and four degrees. So it would be set three and a half or four for probably an A3 Skyhawk, uh, A3 uh, Skywalker, to come down to get the correct hook to ramp clearance and hit number three wire. So as you go high, that image, meatball, goes up into the next cell. And it's it's not where you see this and you don't see you see this. It's sort of like the sun coming up or going down, you know how it's it's uh, uh, 
egg-shaped and kind of elongated. Well, that's what you see as you move from cell to cell. You go too high, you don't see anything. You go too low, you see red, you know there's something wrong. And you go further low, you don't see anything. By then, the LSO is screaming at you on the radio. The red vertical lights, those are the wave-off lights. The LSO has a pickle switch, dead man switch, where he hits it, and those lights flash like that. That's the same with the paddles as wave off. Across the top, you see one's missing on this side, and the one that's here has a blue lens on it. It should be two and two. Those are your uh, come on lights. It's an add power light for Jess. The LSO flashes that at you, it means add power. You probably say it on the radio anyway. And if you're flying a prop plane, you get that flashed in close, that takes the cut. It's the same with the paddles, close the throttles, go ahead and land. The plat system, pilot landing aid television system, is a system wherein there are cameras out in the, the center line of the landing area. There's two cameras. They switch from one to the other, depending again upon the size aircraft coming aboard. And that is what's taking your picture as you come aboard seen this in movies. Pride Fly has a monitor, the bridge has a monitor, the LSO had a small monitor to his feet. Crosshair superimposed. You can see the airplane coming down the glide path. It's high or low and check the lineup. That is used to play back in the ready room during debrief and in case there's an accident is played at the accident uh, investigation. And when we move over uh, to the next spot I'll have you uh, take a picture of what that uh, lens looks like to differentiate it from centerline uh, lights. There was a backup system design called Movilas, M-O-V-L-A-S, Manually Operated Visual Approach Landing System, used when the mirror was malfunctioning or out of adjustment, or if the ship was pitching and rolling too much, it was not usable. And by the way, the SS class operation only had uh, heat, uh, adjustment through the ship's gyros for pitch, compensate for some degree for ship's pitch. The, the newer carriers also have roll and heave adjustment. Us. If the manual system has to be used, back at the LSO platform, the device is rigged. It's a, it's a rotary switch with a handle on it. Right there, where there's a hole in the deck there, there's a well below that red lens. That's where a stack of lights was put. It had light bulbs on them like this. The LSO would manually move the ball up and down by moving that rotary switch back there and this would create this image, a false image, this mechanically operated ball to go high and to go low. It would be the same as if you were waving with paddles until the pilot is high, low. And that was the Movilast system. The red lights inboard the large were part of the Movilast system for wave offs. They have the same function as the large red lights. Starting, stopping here for a moment to point out the, I just talked about the PLAT system, pilot landing aid television system, and cameras under the flight deck. This is one such uh, location. There's a heavy slit and a heavy piece of glass in there. There's a small room down below that has a rack. And this video camera comes up and looks through that glass up the glide path. If you look forward, you see another large uh, fixture, just like this one. You can see the slit. Now that's the forward camera. After that is a small fixture, just like the one under my right foot right here. That is a centerline light, not to be confused with the other fixtures. I mentioned earlier there were several ordnance elevators on the ship. This is another one. This is a bomb elevator. This is, I think, called number three. It makes, uh, I mentioned the other two forward and then this one here. In front of this, we have a section of deck that has been uh, removed. This goes back to when Hornet was up at Bremerton, Washington. The Hornet Club had some reunions there, and they were allowed to cut out some of the deck, cut up pieces, 
and give it to the members. That's why this is uh, looks the way it does. But you can see the composition of the uh, two types of wood over the steel plate over the I-beams. Now we'll look aft at the starboard barricade. Not barrier, barricade. The mate on the other side is also in the down position. And at the base is the number five arresting gear shiv. Number five engines down below. There's four arresting gear engines, five arresting gear engines on the angle deck carrier. Normally number five is not rigged, but only rigged when there's a known emergency coming aboard. The webbing would be brought out, the cable would be hooked up. The, the cables, by the way, of the arresting gear, the cable comes out on deck and then stops, and there's a big zinc swage fitting about this big at the end of it. And then you take an 80-foot section and connect the two, each same size cable, same number of strands, with a swage fitting on the, each end, and you fit them together and pin them. And that's how you complete the system. So when you have a known emergency coming aboard, which could be a, a gear failure, tail failure, hydraulic failure, an uh, airplane unable to tank if it, if it has that capability, or a single engine trap, you're not going to bolt on one engine, so you have to stay aboard. So that's when this would be rigged. And it could be done, the drill, I think the maximum time is two minutes. It was one of those things that you were tested on. Cable would be hooked up, and the the mat, the webbing was stored underneath the flight deck over there. I think it was brought out, it was all hooked up, and then it was elevated, all ready to receive the airplane. Now that's nylon webbing, that's vertical webbing like this. The airplane hopefully goes in squarely on the deck and into it, and everything should be fine. Little damage to the leading edge devices, and hopefully that's all. I got it. You always flew with your canopy closed when you got launched yeah. and recovered. Right. Now, in the early days, it's interesting, I think Dale Bourbon told me this, in the early days when the jets were first introduced to the straight deck and they developed the Palisades barrier because the the, the, the Davis barriers for the props just wasn't... That was just wire. That was a big hunk of wire. Right, there were two, wrap two the cables, gear. yeah. And so this other arrangement, however, they used to come aboard with the canopies open, the Panthers, right. Cougars. Because you vent in the water, you wanted to get out of the airplane. Right. That cable they had cases yeah, where it came right. down, yeah. you know. Right. And so, <laughs> good question, Jim. I, I don't know. Uh, maybe watch some videos of some uh, right. of some uh, respites. You know, matter of fact, then the next cruise we, I was in the Cougars, and, and our policy had switched. You landed canopy clothes. Uh huh. Uh, and I think right. basically because of the possibility you don't want to get decapitated. <laughs> yeah. 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 Makes sense. <laughs> this, by the way, I won't bother to shoot this. When this, uh, when these were straight decks, I mentioned you had 12 wires, and they were about 10 feet apart. The first wire was right forward of the LSO platform, and later with the angle deck, you can see where they're located. They're much farther apart. But the same idea, explaining uh, what this is here. Now the cable came across. And there was a spring mechanism in here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Operated by a deck edge operator, and I can't remember whether they were compressed air or hydraulic, but he operated a lever, and this spring thing did this, and it lifted the cable about that high off the deck, giving the tail hook a chance to grab the wire. And once the airplane was down, then they'd flop that, uh, those would flop down again. But even when they were up, your, your nose gear, being the smallest tire on an airplane, would not get caught in that, even though it was raised that high. What this is here, this hard rubber, when the cable comes out and, say, the airplane catches this wire, it pulls it out and up, out so far. And that swage fitting and the cable itself eventually slams back down on the deck. And that's designed to absorb that impact rather than uh, tear up the the deck itself. After the angle deck was put on, the drop center line light was added, which is the top of which you see right there. We'll get a picture of it later on down below, looking at the whole post down on off of the uh, fantail. And what that did 
when you're out here behind the ship at night, you're looking at the center line, center line lights, and those were the same lights going down. And you couldn't tell that they were 90 degrees to each other. What you saw was a straight line while you were lined up. Now, one of the downsides of the angle deck carrier is that center line is always moving away from you, so you're constantly having to work on your lineup. What this does is help with that. As you get off to one side or the other, that line breaks like this. And it's sort of like a flight director in the cockpit. It's telling you which way to go. So from that reasoning, one could deduce that flying off the carrier and landing at nighttime is easier than in the daytime. But that's not true. Okay, What I'm going to finish up with now is uh, paddle signals, and uh, I'll finish up at the LSO platform. I would step on the platform, except I'd have to step over this fence, which is bogus. This is, of course, not. This is for you, the public. But there was a uh, windbreak that was here, and then over here on the angle deck, there's a console of instruments. Uh, read out from the SBN-12 radar up in the uh, pry fly, wind uh, direction and uh, velocity indicators, and so on. At my feet, there was two talkers here, or rather one talker and a hook spotter. The talker was connected to the pry fly. As I mentioned earlier, we flew a flat pass around on the straight deck carrier. So the airplane would be about the 90 to the 45, and the LSO would be out there facing that direction, of course and pick the airplane up like this if the airplane was about where it should be, altitude-wise. If it was low, this was the low signal, high. Once the airplane corrected, you went back to a roger. Now, the next signal you'd probably give would be a lineup signal. If the airplane looked like it was going to overshoot the center line, you would tell the pilot to increase angle of bank. <laughs> if the pilot was going to line up on this side, shallow out angle of bank. Uh, airspeed signals fast, the airplane's fast like this, add power, this is add power, high dip, low dip, it means just adjust your nose just slightly. And then the rudder kick, this is the rudder kick. Now that was because the airplane was out of balanced flight and you were afraid if you cut them that way the airplane would go off, it would not end up on the center line. So <clears throat> that was used more probably in the World War II days, single engine airplanes flew a tighter, closer pattern and the pilots often got the cut when they were still in a, in a bank. And uh, that's why the pilot had to know the LSO, his personality. You could, you could let some pilots get by with a little bit more, and other ones you didn't trust very well, you'd send them around and tell them to do it over again. The signals I gave you were all advisory. The only mandatory signals were two, wave off and the cut. There it goes, and the cut. Oh. Other signals were, you got your flaps, you got your landing gear, you got your tail hook. This signal means when you're bouncing on shore, we're doing practice not on the ship but ashore, that means stay down after this pass. And then this signal paddles in hand like this, that means orbit, just go up in orbit. We're up in uh, Vulture's Row now, so called because this is where people come to watch flight deck crashes, I mean landings. What this was originally, this area, it was the anti-aircraft fire control director base here, and then the director was above it to control the four 5-inch 38 anti-aircraft guns that were out on the flight deck originally. Same arrangement forward as I mentioned earlier. When they put the angle deck on, they put the pry fly, the control tower here, and they took this out and made a place for people to come and watch the landings. The dome behind me is the approach control radar for low visibility carrier approaches. This stand, pedestal right up there, was mounted, on it was mounted an SPN-12 radar. The person mounted that, trained it on the inbound aircraft, and that fed into a computer and made a closure on the ship. There's a readout up in PryFly I'll talk about we get up there. Also, I had one at my feet at the LSO platform showing aircraft speed, indicated airspeed. And that information was also fed into a computer for another purpose, which I'll talk about uh, when we get up there. 
the floodlights you see here and also up there, those were put on these ships about 1961, about the time I got to the fleet on my carrier, the Lake Champlain. And they had red lenses over them, the idea of which was to eliminate the flight deck at night so the crews could pre-flight their airplanes without tripping and falling over fire bottles, wheel shocks, and uh, tie downs. Before, we just had a, our little flashlight with a red lens on it. And once you get in the, in the airplanes, the engine started, we shut those off. The cones you see up here, there's a set four and aft and a four chips. Those are called Phaser 90 antennas. They send out a UHF signal to thwart inbound missiles on the ship. We're in prime fly now, primary flight control or the control tower. I mentioned earlier in the talk about the drop center line light back at the uh, fan tail of the ship. This is the control for that section of lights. Coming around here, this panel is the control panel for the stroboscopic light down the center line of the deck, called the rabbit. Civil airports have the same thing. A sequential flashing white light, it's like a rapid fire light that goes down the center line of the deck and then down the drop center line. Again, that line looks like a single line going out into space. That is usually what a pilot will see under low visibility conditions. The first thing he will see of the environment of the landing area. Now once the pilot gets in close and you see other, you have other cues, then you tell the pilot or the tower operator to kill the rabbit. The panel above the, this control, small panel with three meters on it, this is the control panel for the magic carpet floodlights that I talked about um, above. Next panel inboard is the master lighting control panel for all the lights out on the flight deck. The deck edge lights, the round down lights, the center line lights, the runway lights, the foul line light, and the free deck launch light. The next console over is the arresting gear control console. You'll see six stations across here. Only five are used. This is a spare. As I mentioned earlier, there are five arresting gear engines down underneath the flight deck. There are numbers that appear in here, and these buttons change those numbers. That is the, what, the final result is the weight of the inbound aircraft. You've heard the term, call the ball, beat ball. Well, the pilot calls seeing the optical landing system meet ball when he can, in close enough, probably eight to a quarter mile. A ball call will go like this. 1.5, scooter ball, 1.5. What that means is scooter's an A4 Skyhawk, so that it identifies that model airplane. Airplane side number is 1.5. The pilot is Smith. The LSO needs to know who the pilot is. As I mentioned earlier, every pilot has his own signature. He sees the meat ball. He's somewhere on the glide path, maybe not a centered ball and he's got 1,500 pounds of fuel in the airplane. So that's added to the basic weight of the airplane, and that's the number that's put in here. <clears throat> Additionally, the SPN-12 that I talked about, which is down on that platform, having a readout up here showing the airplane's rate of closure on the ship, and that's <clears throat> calibrated or compensated for the wind over the deck, and this shows the airplane's indicated airspeed, or thereabouts, or true airspeed. That is fed into the computer as well. So that tells the arresting gear engine how much weight and at what speed, what engagement speed, uh, the weight will engage that arresting wire. It has to be set proper because if it's set too tight, it'll pull the tail hook out of the airplane. If it's set too loose, it'll pull all the cable out and to block the mechanism underneath the deck and damage it. So that's why this is station is manned. This is the optical landing system control console. These are the light controls, the intensity of the various lights down there. These controls, this is for the roll basic angle, and this toggle switch here adjusts the roll angle for each type aircraft. Plat system, I talked about earlier down on the flight deck. There's one of the monitors right there.
There's one on the bridge, one at the LSO platform, and all the ready rooms. The arrow, this is often asked, what is the arrow? There's another one up at the forward window. This is for the helicopter people. The information is taken off of the anemometer readout up here, the wind velocity, and that tells the helicopter people when it's safe or not safe to engage the rotor head. If you have too much wind over the deck, the blade coming into the wind, those are airfoils of course, flex up and then the receding blade will go down like this and you get this wobbly effect and it can damage either the blades or the rotor head. So that's why the crew out there needs to know what the wind over the deck is. Squawk boxes around, you'll see these all over the ship to talk to various places in the ship. Wind speed direction indicators I mentioned up here. An ARC-27 aircraft radio, this is what we had in the airplanes at the time. UHF frequency spectrum, which is what military operates on tactically. The Airboss would normally stay on one frequency, but he can switch to any other frequency. The Airboss, by the way, control the airspace out to uh, 5 or 10 miles and up to about 10,000 feet, if I remember right. A gyro repeater off one of the two of the ship's gyros, which are down on the center line of the keel to give ship's heading information. Telephone that probably being in a red cradle went to the bridge. And over here are two switches. The catapults are hydraulic, but they're electrically controlled. So if the air boss at the last minute sees something out there on the flight deck, an airplane ready to launch, and he's fluid leaking out of it, uh, flaps are not set correctly, the inspection panel's loose, he can reach up here, kill the circuit, and when the shooter down there pushes the button to fire the cat, hopefully will not fire. Coming back to the master lighting console, which was not seen very clearly because the camera was outside. Now we're looking straight on at it. This lighting console was for all the lights out on the flight deck. I'll read off the labels across deck surface, runway edge, port and starboard, Runway and guide, a thwart ship guide, that's the angle deck. Deck edge, launch line, lineup lights, that's for the free deck launch, as I talked about earlier. Safe parking, which is the, the safety or foul line that's hatched red and white. A thwart ship guide bow, those are the bow lights all the way forward. And the signal and homing. And then these are rheostats for each of the circuits. I'll mention one thing quickly. If you were the first airplane aboard, or the first two, and they spotted you all the way forward, port or starboard, when you were taxied up there at night, you were hoping that your brakes worked, the deck wasn't slippery, and the director knew what he was doing. Because when you taxied up there and those little white lights disappeared under your nose, you knew that there was only a few feet before you went over. And uh, that was as hairy as the this part back here, the landing you just done and successfully walked away from. Finishing up on the uh, coverage of PryFly, we'll look at the status board here. The Air Boss would like to know what was going on. So you have the type aircraft in this column, the radio call sign, the launch time, recovery time, kilo. If I remember right, kilo was your signed altitude in case you had radio communications. Then you had a procedure wherein you came back to the ship, no comm. Airplane side number, pilot mission data, and then alternate airfield data. Bingo is a carrier term, which means where you go if you can't get back aboard your own ship. It could be another ship, it could be an airfield, or you want also nearest land, just in case there's no ship available, there's no airport available, and you're going to have to ditch or bail out and you want to be near land, that information would go here. And then finally at the bottom you have weather, your local area, and at the bingo uh, field. Thank you very much.